Hello, Psychology 158 class. How are you doing? This is Dr. Palmer. As promised, I'm continuing my lecture on Chapter 5, Color Perception. And we're picking up here uh, on this slide. Make sure I'm in the right spot here. Yeah, okay. So picking up here on the slide where we were talking about um, James Maxwell's color uh, matching technique, and it's still used today. So the way it works is you've got a, a light that shines on a screen, say on the left, and in this case it's like a cyanish blue light. And then on the right screen you've got three spotlights, a blue, green, and red, corresponding to short, medium, and long wavelengths, that are shining all at the same point, all at the same spot. And you allow the participant um, to crank up the blue, green, and red lights, to uh, match the spot that you see on the left. So this is the method of adjustment that we talked about at the beginning of this course. And <clears throat> what's surprising is that if you have a properly selected blue, green, and red light, which by the way correspond to the peak sensitivity of your short, medium, and long cones respectively, then uh, a user can adjust those lights and can match any light that you put on the left side of the screen. So it just takes three lights, red, green, and blue, to be able to match any color that you can perceive on the other side of the screen. Um, <clears throat> so that adds credence to this uh, young Helmholtz trichromatic theory of color vision. The, the trichromatic theory is that you need blue, green, and red lights to reproduce any light that you can see. So <clears throat> another thing that's happening here in in this example with Maxwell's procedure is this is additive color mixing. So in additive color mixing, you're shining lights on top of each other and the spectrums from each of those lights sum together. And the spectrum you perceive is the addition of those two spectrums together. And so for example, if we uh, shine a blue light and a yellow light onto the same surface, what you will perceive is a white light. Um, and the reason is that the blue light has the short wavelengths in it, the yellow light has both the medium and long wavelengths in it. So where they overlap, they're adding together, and you have short, medium, and long wavelengths all being represented. When uh, light has all wavelengths, short, medium, and long, we perceive it as white. White is just the combination of all colors together. The other thing to remember here is that uh, we talked about the idea uh, that uh, red and green light together form yellow. Okay, so that's a metamer. A single yellow spectrum uh, can be matched by a combination of red and green light. Red and green make yellow when we're talking about additive color mixing. So here's another example of additive color mixing which is kind of interesting. Uh, if you look at this pointillist painting uh, of a uh, harbor scene, down there on the boat uh, it kind of looks orange You've got this uh, sort of orange image that, that looks like uh, here I'm pointing to. You're kind of reflecting off the boat. Um, and uh, if you zoom in, it turns out that there isn't much orange there, right? So there's some golden yellow, there's some red, there's kind of pink. But when you stand far away, it looks like an orange reflection or orange side to the boat that's probably due to this sunset scene. So this is another example of color additive color mixing because the when you're far enough away, those little patches of color all sort of combine together because they're too small for you to see at a distance. Additive color mixing is what you do with lights, but subtractive color mixing is the kind of mixing you do with paints. And this is probably the most uh, common kind of color mixing. It's probably the one you're most familiar with. And so <clears throat> let's explain subtractive color mixing. So under the rules of subtractive color mixing, blue and yellow make green, which is different. Under the rules of additive color mixing, blue and yellow make, I'm sorry, yeah, blue and yellow make um, white. But in subtractive color mixing, blue and yellow make green. Here's the reason. You've got white light coming in. As I said, that's all parts of the spectrum. So if white light comes in and uh, it either passes through a filter, so that's like a kind of yellow uh, filter you'd put in front of a light, or you could think of this as being yellow paint. A yellow pigment looks yellow because what happens is when light hits it, 
all of the short wavelengths are absorbed, but the medium and long wavelengths come through. And as we established a moment ago, medium plus long wavelengths of light cause you to uh, perceive it as yellow. So um, white light hits a yellow filter, short wavelengths go away, but medium and long come through. Uh, now we can look down here at the blue filter. What a blue filter is, is that it allows the short and medium wavelengths to come through, but the long wavelengths are filtered out. So when we combine the yellow filter and the blue filter, or similarly, yellow paint and blue paint, um, the long end of the spectrum is absorbed by the yellow filter, but it lets the medium come through. The sh the the um, sorry, the short end is absorbed by the yellow filter. It lets the long come through. The long end is filtered by the blue, and it lets the short come through. But the only thing they have in common is that they both let this medium through. And so if the medium uh, wavelengths are coming through, then what you're going to perceive is green paint or a green light that's coming from those two filters. So that's because green or the medium wavelengths are sort of the only thing left after everything else has been filtered. So this is why we call it subtractive color mixing because it's removing parts of the spectrum and what remains is what the, the color that you perceive. Whereas additive color mixing, you're layering lights on top of each other and they add together to create a larger amount of spectrum than what each individual component was on its own. So moving out of uh, the eye, the retina, <clears throat> and getting into lateral geniculate nucleus, you find cells that have a center surround receptive field. And we know that. We've been talking about kind of uh, light on the center, dark on the surround. We've been talking about these sorts of receptive fields. But it turns out there's also cone opponent cells. So these are neurons that um, mark contrast between red and green or blue and yellow. So these cone opponent cells also have a center surround organization. Um, we're going to talk more about cone opponent cells a little bit later. So we've talked about color detection in step one. We talked about color discrimination in step two. And now we're going to talk about color appearance. And um, one thing to talk about in terms of color appearance is the idea of a color space. And I started to explain this on Wednesday a little bit, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail now. You can imagine all of the possible color combinations as occupying something like a three-dimensional space, we call a color space. And um, one way to think about it is in terms of red, green, and blue light. So let me jump out of my PowerPoint here and go over to, um, let's see, we're going to look at color space. Um, so uh, here's an example of an RGB color space. and Let's see, that's not the best example. Here we go. Um, so looking at this uh, cube here, what we have is we have red anchored here, blue anchored there, and green anchored there. And as you move along the cube, you have different combinations of red, green, and blue. So up here in this corner is the combination of blue and green. That's cyan. Here we have blue and red, that's magenta. Down here we have red and green, and as we talked about, that's yellow. So in this color space, the axes we're talking about are red, green, and blue, but you could think of the whole color space as being every possible combination of those. So notice that you could have other anchors. For instance, your anchors could be cyan, magenta, and yellow. So, um, and then if you include black, that's K, then you end up with CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black. That's another kind of color system. Same color space, different anchors for your axes, um, and, and, and depending on what your function is, what you're trying to do with that color, um, you might use one system or another. Okay, so um, color space is just this, that three-dimensional space, and you can think of it as being uh, in terms of red, green, blue, uh, and, and that's kind of convenient if you're talking about cones because that corresponds roughly to the long, medium, and short cones, red, green, and blue lights. Uh, that's, that's a useful way to go. Another popular way to think about color spaces in terms of HSB, hue, saturation, and brightness. And so the hue is the color, and then the saturation is, it says the chromatic strength. I think of it as like the number of uh, pieces of color per unit area. 
that's the saturation. And then the brightness is the distance from black. So the less brightness, the closer to black, and the more brightness, the uh, farther away from black. So let's go um, look up here, color space, HSB. And um, here we have kind of interesting uh, color situation. So um, in this case, we're conceptualizing color space as proceeding along a wheel. So if you look at uh, moving around the circle, you've got your different hues. So we can't see red right here, but you know, red, orange, yellow, green, uh, cyan, you know, indigo, blue, purple. And uh, brightness is going up in this particular case. So what you can see along the bottom is this is really black. So if you look in this kind of orange here, as it goes down, it gets darker and darker. There's less light that's coming off of the orange. So by the time you're at zero brightness, everything looks black. Uh, and then starting in the center and moving outwards, we have increases in saturation. So again, if you look at this orange, if it's very saturated, it's like there's a lot of color per unit area. And then as you move towards the center, which is less and less saturation, you have less color per unit area. So you've got this combination, this slice through this color space here is for a particular shade of orange, and you see all the combinations of from low to high saturation and from high to low brightness. Um, here's some other uh, kind of images of these things. Here's another one. Again, you've got hue going around the circle on the outside, saturation in the center. This one says value. Value is roughly the same thing as, as brightness. Um, let's see. This one's kind of interesting. Um, it shows you these cones, and then you can see that um, each slice through has a different brightness. So by the time you get down here, everything's looking pretty black because you've got zero brightness. All right, that's the idea of HSB space, and um, that's also very useful. So um, in a computer program, you have, uh, like PowerPoint has this, you can choose whether you want to do RGB sliders or HSB sliders, and uh, you can adjust the amount of red, green, and blue in your, um, in your color swatch, and that's essentially just kind of moving you through this color space in one direction or another. If you're doing HSB sliders, you're, first of all, uh, this first slider is the hue. It's going to move you around the circle. And then saturation is going to move you in and out. And then brightness is going to move you up and down. So these are just different ways of navigating pretty much the same color space, right? The same kinds of colors. It's just how do you want to access them? All right. So we've talked about trichromatic theory. Um, there's also a really important theory called opponent color theory. And the opponent color theory says that your three cones, long, medium, and short, red, green, and blue, are in opposition to each other. And in particular, there seem to be certain colors that are in opposition to each other. So uh, red is in opposition to green, and blue is opposition to yellow. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, how is there yellow if we only have red, green, and blue cones, right, uh, long, medium, and short? Yellow is your brain combining the outputs of your medium and long cones together. Your brain adds medium plus long, and that equals yellow. And we showed uh, earlier that you know red plus green makes yellow. So you have LGN cells that have, um, instead of like an on center, off surround, or a white center, a black surround, now you've got red center, green surround, or blue center, yellow surround. And these um, are called color opponent cells. Um, so you have not only red versus green, you also have blue versus yellow cells. And yellow is going to be the outputs of the L plus M cones together, L plus M. So Edward Herring, uh, or sorry, U Ewald Herring is uh, famous for having noticed that you can have some color combinations, but you can't have others. So you can combine blue and green. That leads to cyan. You can have a reddish yellow. That's orange. You can have a bluish red. That's purple. But you can't have a reddish green, and you can't have a bluish yellow. right? Um, so here's his image uh, that depicts this. Uh, the idea is that if we look around this color wheel, you've got these different color swatches. And they have some combination. So like orange is some combination of red and yellow. 
and uh, this kind of um, green up here is a combination of blue and green, but you don't have anything that's a combination of blue and yellow, and you don't have anything that's a combination of red and green. And so I want you to keep this image in mind because in a few minutes we're going to talk about color cancellation experiments, which are um, going to be related to this idea that these colors are in opposition to each other and can't coexist. So in a hue cancellation experiment, you start with a color, for instance, bluish green, and then you want to get rid of the green. Okay, so how do you get rid of the green? You add red light to it. So think about that setup with the Herring, uh, with the Maxwell experiment where they're shining lights on each other. So if you've got a bluish green, the way you could cancel out the green is you could shine some red light on it. And if you add more red, that's going to cancel out the blue, or the green, because red and green are in opposition to each other. And what you end up with is just blue. So here's, here's what I just said, but in pictures. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a bluish green. There's not that much green in there, just a little bit. So if I add a little bit of red, that will cancel out the green, and you end up looking like uh, just a pure blue without any red or green in it. On the other hand, instead of a little green, you had a lot of green, then you would have to add a lot of red. See, here's a little bit of red to cancel a little bit of green. Here's a lot of red to cancel a lot of green. And you end up with a pure blue again, but this time it's actually um, brighter. It's closer to white. And the reason is that you had to add more energy. So remember, white is all the colors, all the lights together. So since you're adding more redness to cancel out the greenness, then you're going to end up with a brighter light that's closer to white, but it's still pure blue. There's no red or green in there. So you can use this hue cancellation paradigm to figure out how much red or green or blue or yellow is present in any hue. So if there's a lot of blue in a hue, you could cancel out blue by adding yellow. If there's a lot of red in a hue, you could cancel out the red by adding green, and etc. So <clears throat> looking at these graphs here, um, starting with the wavelength along the bottom, we've got our rainbow here. And uh, if you look at this part right here, this part of the curve right here, this red part, is the amount of green you would have to add to cancel out the red. So if we just, these, each of these data points, if you had if you saw the little data points, they'd be the amount of green that, that people added on average to make this color look purely without any red or green, just pure yellow. And so what you can see is that there's a lot of green you have to add on this side, which means there's a lot of red, and we can kind of see that, right? This is where orange and red are, so there's a lot of red here. In this region, uh, you have to add red to cancel out the green. And so you see there's a lot of green in this region. And then as we get closer to the end, we're at the purple region, so there's some red in, in this part of the spectrum too. Interestingly, there are certain places on this spectrum where you don't have to add any red or green. The blue automatically appears to not have any red or green in it, and or the yellow appears to not have any red or green in it. And you can predict where that's going to be because of where these things cross, and they switch over from needing to add green to needing to add red. And so those are called unique hues. This is a unique blue, this is a unique yellow, and so what that means is uh, this unique yellow is a yellow that has no hint of red or green in it. Likewise, this unique green is a green that's pure green and has no hint of yellow or blue in it. Uh, I don't know why they don't show it here, but unique red would be over here somewhere, and that would be a pure red without any sense of blue or yellow in it. So in other words, no purple, no orange, just pure red. So, uh, the idea that red and green cancel each other shows that they're in opposition, and the idea that blue and yellow cancel each other shows that they're in opposition. So this helps us to understand the next step, of the step of discrimination in our three steps of color perception. So step one, your short, medium, and long cones register the light that's coming into the system. Step two, they start to act in opposition to each other to discriminate the lights. So your, your long and medium, so you have some neurons or some LGN cells that represent L minus M. So how much more red than green is there? You have other neurons that represent M minus L, which is how much 
uh, green as opposed to red is there. And then when you get to blue versus yellow, the S is blue, but what's yellow? Well, yellow is just long and medium light together, right? Red plus green equals yellow. So here you have yellow minus blue, or L plus M minus S, and then this is blue minus yellow. So that's the blue versus yellow range. And so then finally we get to this idea of color appearance. All right, so, so the way colors actually appear is not purely how they uh, are detected on your eyes. They involve this idea of contrasting the amount of red and green or blue and yellow that's in there. So here this is in, in graphs. We've got our, our detection by our uh, short, medium, and long cones. Then they do the L minus M and the M minus L. So L minus M is going to be this red guy. That's the place where there's more red than green, and it makes sense because down here there's orange. There's definitely more red than green in here. And then over here, this green one, that's the M minus L. So that's over here in this green part of the spectrum. There's more green than red here. And then the same thing for blue and yellow. This is where there's more blue than yellow. Uh, that's the S minus L plus M, or blue minus yellow. And then here's where it's yellow minus blue. And so this part of the spectrum has more yellow in it, and you see that there's a peak above zero here. So that's the discrimination stage. And then finally, you end up with these color opponent cells. And the color opponent cells are going to have um, pretty strong response to green in this region, a strong response to red in this region and that region. Again, that's because of the purple over here. And then on the blue-yellow spectrum, you got more blue on this end of the spectrum and more yellow on this end of the spectrum. So <clears throat> when you look in LGN, we have uh, center surround opponent cells, uh, and we've talked about them in terms of like on center, off surround, that is white in the center, um, black in the surround, but you also have red center green surround, green center red surround, you have blue center yellow surround, and yellow center blue surround. So um, let's go, let me show you some images of these things. Okay, so this is what the, the uh, receptive fields of these color opponent cells in LGN look like. So you have yellow in the on in the center and blue off in the surround and you know blue on yellow off red on green off green on red off so um, that's in LGN um, then when we get to primary visual cortex now you end up with these double opponent cells okay so of course why, why, why would things stay simple they're going to get more complicated so these double opponent cells, it's not just red on the center and green off the surround. It's that it's, um, here, let me show you pictures. So um, in the LGN, you have L, pl L plus, that's red on, and then M minus, green off. So um, that's what the best stimulus would look like for this, a red thing just in the center. But when we get to cortex, you get these double opponent cells. So it's red on the center, but green off center. So it's not just that red excites the center, it's that green shuts down the center. And then in the surround, you have red off and green on. So it's not just that there's green in the surround, it's that if red hits the surround, it will also shut down the cell. Um, so <clears throat> for these single opponent cells, we can look at here, um, this one only wants red on the center, so this is the worst place for it to be because there's no red, and so it's not getting anything of what it wants, and it's getting green in the surround, and that shuts it down. So that's the worst place. Uh, this is better because the green shuts it down, and part of the green is, is there's no green here because it's in the red. So you're lacking some of the inhibition here. This is even better because now the red on the center gets everything it wants, but you're still getting some green in the surround, this part right here, so that's not great. What's the best is you're only getting the red on the center and there's no green anywhere, so there's nothing to shut down the cell, and that indicates this is the best stimulus. That's what's going on in LGN in the top row. 
in cortex, it's a little bit more complicated, of course. So this stimulus wants red on the center and green on the surround, and it's, in, it's inhibited by the opposite. So it's inhibited by green in the center, and it's inhibited by red in the surround. So here it's neutral because um, you've got <clears throat> mediums are happy because they're in green in the uh, surround, but then it's also getting inhibited in the center. So th that's nothing. Nothing happens here. And then again, let's look at the neutral for the same thing. Here you've got um, red in the surround, so that shuts it down, but you also have red in the center, which excites it. So in both of these cases, if it's just pure red or pure green, that's really neutral for this particular kind of cell. Um, here is the worst position because you've got um, L minus, and so it's getting some inhibition from the red, and you've got M minus in the center, and it's 100% in the green, and so that's 100% inhibition here, and some partial inhibition here. Um, there's some uh, partial excitation here, but it's not enough to come overcome all of it. And then this is actually the best position, because the L plus in the center is getting all the red it needs, and the M uh, let's see, yeah, the M plus in the surround is getting a little bit of excitation here. Um, so this is going to give you the peak response. So in LGN, the cells are responding to the presence of red or green. And in cortex, they're responding to the contrast between red and green. So there really is this L minus M or M minus L thing happening by the time you get to cortex. All right, so that's, that's our section on uh, our, our color receptors and how they differ in, in LGN and cortex. Now we're going to talk about um, individual differences in color perception. In other words, what, what is it like for different people to perceive color? And when you're talking about what it's like for somebody to perceive a color, in other words, what's their private conscious experience of a color, what you're talking about is qualia. And qualia is sort of like the the blueness of blue, um, the experience of seeing blue. And if you wanted to ask the question, is my perception of blue the same as your perception of blue? Boy, that's a really tough question to ask. Um, in some sense, you're asking, is my conscious experience of blue the same as your conscious experience of blue? And there's really just no way to know that because we don't have access to other people's consciousness. We can't experience exactly what they're experiencing. Uh, let me give you an example of why this might be a hard question. Let's imagine for the sake of argument that um, I look at things and, and I see something that's blue and I have a particular experience of blue. Let's imagine you look at the same thing and your qualia, your experience of blue, actually looks like purple. Like if I had access to your consciousness and I saw what you see when you look at what I think is blue, you might actually be experiencing purple. But you grew up your whole life calling that experience of purple the label blue. So what I would call purple, you call blue. And we have no way of knowing whether that's true or not. Because obviously, you know, we could try comparing color labels, and we're going to do that here in a second. Um, but it doesn't really get at the, at the inner conscious experience of what it's like to perceive that color. And you know what? We may never, ever get there. Because it's, it's really, until we figure out a way to kind of, I don't know, run an Ethernet cable between our two brains and share our consciousness, we're not going to be able to reach in and, and experience what it's like to actually ex have somebody else's consciousness. Anyway, we're going to look at some different, some idea, you know, what is it like for different people to experience color? And I'm going to ask the question, does everyone see colors the same way? And... Uh, this may or may not be satisfying to you, but I'm going to give you three different answers, okay? So I'm going to tell you yes, maybe, and no. <laughs> so I'm going to give you some evidence that, you know, maybe we do experience colors the same way. I'm going to talk about some other evidence, like maybe we do, maybe we don't. Probably we do in some sense. I think that's going to come out, and the maybe section is going to end up being more like yes. And then we're going to talk about uh, no, and there's a very clear way in which we don't share the same color experience because some people are colorblind and some people are not. So first, do we see colors the same way? Well, one way to measure that is to show people patches of colors 
and see what they label them. Okay, so like if I show you a patch of red, do you call that red or do you call that orange, for instance? And there's this interesting concept, which is the concept of basic color terms. And a basic color term is a one word description for a color. Okay, um, anytime you're using compound color descriptions, that means you're using multiple descriptors. So a basic color term would be blue. A compound color term would be light blue or baby blue or royal blue or sky blue. Okay, those are two words. So we have a certain number of colors that we have basic color terms for, and some of them are very universally agreed on by people who speak the same language and are from the same culture. So Lindsay and Brown asked a bunch of Americans uh, to name color patches. What they did was they just got a bunch of color patches and they put them in front of people and they said, if you had to give that a one word name, right, a basic color name, what would that be? And for 11 colors, black, white, red, yellow, green, blue, brown, pink, orange, purple, and gray, there was nearly universal agreement. If you, if you set a brown paint chip in front of somebody, everybody calls it brown, okay? Um, but for other single word colors, basic color names, there was much less agreement. So for instance, let's consider aqua. Um, you might put that paint chip in front of somebody and maybe they call it aqua, maybe they call it turquoise, maybe they call it teal. <laughs> and you're going to have some disagreement. So, so the size of these bars shows the amount of agreement. And what it indicates is that there's 11 basic colors that at least Americans, speaking English, really agree upon. Um, if, if in the future, if other colors end up becoming part of our basic color repertoire, the most likely candidates are peach and teal because they were just below universal agreement, but uh, they seem like, you know, at some point maybe they'll become part of our basic color repertoire. But we can say that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, uh, purple, pink, gray, and brown, and black and white are, are 11 basic colors. So um, if you, you know, do, does everyone see colors the same way? Yes, in a sense, because if you show them paint chips, there are some colors that people have very universal agreement on. That's these 11 basic colors. Um, but notice that we were very careful to say Americans who speak English. And that's because different cultures and different languages have different kinds of terms for colors. So um, there's uh, uh, this idea of cultural relativism. Um, you may have heard it as like called the Worfian hypothesis, named after a, a guy named Worf who proposed this idea first. Um, and the idea is, in some sense, that language limits thought that the words you have in your language affect what you perceive or what you can think about. So uh, somebody, so, so like one of the traditions from the, the Worfian hypothesis is the idea that, you know, Eskimos have all these words for snow. They have way more words for snow than we do. And the reason is that, you know, Eskimos live in snow most of the year. So they, they need, they have all kinds of um, more cognitive subtlety about snow, and that's reflected in their language. And so the fact that they have these words for snow indicates that there's more cognitive subtlety about their thoughts about snow. Um, so that's an idea that language uh, kind of shapes thought or reflects thought. So let's think about a particular culture. There's a culture called the Dani tribe, and they were discovered in New Guinea around the 1950s or 60s. And they were studied by a woman named Eleanor Roche, who's a very interesting and famous cultural anthropologist. And the thing that's really interesting about the Dani tribe is that they have two words for colors. Uh, and, and, and I'm probably going to get these backwards. I never remember it. But for this, I know the two words were mili and mola. I just can't remember which one went with which colors. But for the sake of argument, let's say mili was all of the warm colors. So orange, gold, red. Um, all those colors were considered mealy, and if you showed them a, pa a paint chip with red or orange or yellow, they would. People in the Dani tribe would say that's mealy. All of those colors have the same linguistic label. The other label was mola, and those were for all the cool colors like um, cyan, blue, green, purple, all the kind of colder, bluer colors. 
And so if you showed somebody from the Dani tribe a paint chip that was purple or blue or cyan or teal, they would all say Mola. Okay, so here we have a culture that does not make a linguistic distinction between, for instance, blue and green. Those would both be called Mola. So the question we could ask is, does their lack of a linguistic distinction, a linguistic label between blue and green affect their perception of blue and green? And the experiment goes something like this. Um, let's take the case on the right first. So in these experiments, what you do is you take a card with a, like a paint chip, a color on it, and you show it to somebody, the participant, and you say, okay, remember this color, and then you take it away. And then you show them two cards, one that has the original paint chip, that's the one here on the left, and one that has a slightly different color, the one on the right. And in this case right here, um, especially for English speakers, this would be considered an easy choice. And that's because the original paint chip is, is it's greenish blue, but it falls on the blue side. And when you have to make a, a distinction between these two, one is blue and one of them crosses a categorical boundary and we would call the one on the right green. Okay, So we have a different linguistic label. This is green and this is blue. Or maybe uh, teal or aqua, one of those. Um, but the point is they have two different linguistic labels um, in English. Of course, they have the same lingu linguistic label uh, in, for the Dani tribe. These would both be Mola. Uh, now, the harder choice is this one on the left. Again, same paint chip. I show you the paint chip. I take it away. I give you these two choices. But now, both of these are kinds of blue. So we don't have a difference in a linguistic label for the two choices. So that tends to make this choice harder for people who speak English, where we have different labels uh, for green and blue. And again, uh, in English speakers, we don't really distinguish between blue and aqua, right? Really, we would just call these blue, uh, as we showed you before. So for English speakers, this is an easy choice because it's a choice between bluish thing and something greenish. And this is a harder choice because it's between something that's lightish, lighter bluish and darker bluish. All right, that's the setup. The question is, what happens with the Dani tribe? Every one of these colors would be called Mola. So there's no linguistic variation here. Would they still show the same pattern of data that the ones on the right are an easy choice and the ones on the left are a harder choice? And the result is that they do. They show us the same pattern of data. So what that indicates is despite the fact that there's no linguistic label difference between green and blue here, everything's MOLA, um, they're still perceiving the same kind of perceptual difference between these colors. So um, under this section where it says, do people see colors the same way? Maybe. Well, it might be that linguistic labels affect some of your, uh, your thoughts or your cognitions, but it doesn't seem to happen in terms of color perception. Uh, no matter what color or what culture you came from, uh, no matter what color names you had in your culture, you tend to see colors the same way as, as other people from other cultures. Um, again, as, you know, assuming that you have three functioning cones and you you're not, don't have color anomalous vision. So that's the second answer to the question. Do we all see colors the same way? Well, we might have different linguistic labels, but it seems like we do see all colors the same way. Finally, I'm going to ask the same question again. Does everyone see colors the same? And there's definitely a sense in which people do not perceive colors the same way. And um, about 8% of the male population and about 5%, it's actually uh, probably 0.64%, have some form of color blindness. Um, so the most common color blindness is for people who would be missing the medium cone, the green cone. Um, that is um, the, the, the most common because that medium cone is coded on the X chromosome. And this is why it's more common in men, because men only have one X chromosome. So if you happen to ha get one of the 8% of the X chromosomes in the, in the population that doesn't have a gene for the, the medium cone, then you're going to be a red-green colorblind if you're male. You're going to be a deuteranope. Uh, but to, for a woman, you have to have two X chromosomes that um, neither of them have the gene for the uh, medium cone. And so th that ends up being 0.08 times 0.08, which would be 0.64. So actually, this is a little inaccurate. But uh, 
the female population is it's much rarer to have color blindness in the female population um, than it is for the male population because at least the medium and long cones are carried on the X chromosome. Women get two X chromosomes, so they have a double chance to have a functioning medium and long cone, but men only get the one chance from their one X chromosome. So normally, kind of colloquially, we call people color blind, but actually it's more like the better term is that they're color anomalous. Okay, so um, it's not that they, they're not blind to color, there, are, there actually are people who are blind to color. We're going to talk about them. But uh, people who are red-green colorblind, they're actually color anomalous. They, they experience colors a little bit differently. So there's three types of labels uh, for different kinds of color anomaly depending on which of your cones you don't have a gene for, which one you're missing. Okay. So the deuteranope is by far the most common type. Uh, that's what we typically call red-green colorblind, and that's due to the absence of the medium cone, the green cone. Um, the protonope is the second most common, and that's due to the absence of the L cone, the red cone. And then there's a tritonope, and that's very rare because uh, the short wavelength cone is coded on another chromosome pair. I don't remember which number. Uh, but for you to be a tritonope, you have to be missing the S cone in both of your chromosomes. And so both of your parents would have had to be carriers for this tritonope uh, thing to happen. So that's very, very rare. Um, let's see. I had this open earlier, but let me see uh, if I can get it again. Oh, yeah, I meant color anomaly. Um, okay, so um, this is a good example. So if, if you're someone who happens to be a deuteranope, and um, there's pretty good chance that uh, probably one of the men in the class is a red-green colorblind male, um, here's, <clears throat> here's what the rainbow would look like here, going from long to short, from 700 nanometers to about 375 nanometers. You got your red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Um, a deuteranope would see that same layout as this, okay? So you're not going to see as much of a difference between the kind of red and uh, green area. And so this is why sometimes we say you might be red, green, colorblind, because there's some versions of dark green and dark red that would appear to have the same color to somebody who's a deuteranope. Um, they'd have a hard time distinguishing between some greens in this range and some reds uh, in that range there. So um, if you're somebody in the class and you're looking at these two uh, things and they, they look exactly the same to you, well, maybe you're a deuteranope. Um, and, and that sometimes happens. It happens to about 8% uh, of the population. So um, we have three types of color anomaly, deuteranope, protonope, and tritonope. Make sure you memorize these. I'm going to quiz you about them later. Uh, they're the three types of color anomaly. Um, we also have a situation where you could be a cone monochromat. So that would be if, for instance, you didn't have either a medium or a long cone, and you only had an S cone. And that, that's if you're going to be a cone monochromat, that's the most likely combination for that to happen. Um, in that case, you really are colorblind because you suffer from the problem of univariance, which we started the entire section, uh, this entire lecture on color vision with. And um, you're not going to be able to perceive anything except for luminance differences because you're just operating off of a single photoreceptor. Um, there's another type, which is a rod monochromat. And so there are some people who have no cones at all, and they only have rods. <clears throat> and the situation there is... Um, because you only have rods, you, you only have the photoreceptors that are designed for scotopic or night vision. So uh, being out in the daylight is really painful uh, because your, your rods are so sensitive to light. So if you're somebody who's a rod monochromat, not only do you see only in grayscale, but also you're probably going to need to be wearing some pretty thick sunglasses to make sure that you're not completely overwhelmed by the amount of light that's coming out uh, in the daytime. There's also a way to be colorblind, and that's not due to anything wrong with your, uh, with your cones or rods. 
but it's due to brain damage, and that's called achromatopsia, or without color knowledge. And that's the inability to see color because you had some sort of cortical damage, either a stroke or a traumatic uh, head injury, to an area of your primary visual cortex, uh, area V4 or V3, a B or something like that. So uh, there are some people who get achromatopsia, and it causes them to look at the world and only see it in shades of gray. Um, and then finally, there's another uh, kind of related phenomenon, which is called anomia, which means without naming. And um, that's an inability to name objects or colors. It, it, despite the fact that you can see them and distinguish them, you just can't apply a name to them. And that's different than object agnosia, which we've talked about before. Object agnosia, you can't name objects through your vision sense, but you can name them through the sense of touch or, or that sort of thing. Anomia is you can't name an object at all. Uh, so there, it's, it's not a perception problem, it's a linguistic problem, and it's a different part of the brain. So that's another kind of interesting phenomenon. Okay. So uh, now we're going to talk about different ways that um, colors are influenced by other colors. And we're going to highlight two kind of color effects. One is called a color contrast effect, and the other is called a color assimilation effect. And so a color contrast effect, um, you see the definitions here, but l let, me, uh, let me show you this picture. Um, so let's consider these two green patches right here. Um, what you should notice is that the color of green here and the color of green here looks different. Um, you might also notice it here in the yellow. I feel like it's kind of obvious. Uh, this seems more yellow to me, and this seems a little bit more brown. This green looks a little bit more green. This looks uh, a little bit more red or less green. Um, and, and the reason is that you know, we have these green center, red surround, and you know, these double opponent color cells. So in this case, when you have a red surround, it might be increasing your, boosting your sense of green. But if you have a green surround, it might be decreasing your sense of green. So that's called a color contrast effect. And what you should notice is that you know, the reds don't look the same, the greens don't look the same between top and bottom, yellows and blues, they all look a little different. Um, the next one that's kind of interesting is called the color assimilation effect, and it happens on these sort of checkerboard backgrounds. So this is a checkerboard background of red and green, and then in the center, what we've done is we've placed, replaced the green squares with yellow, or we've replaced the red squares with yellow. And when that happens, the yellow and red sort of combine. So this should look like a more um, reddish yellow, and this should look like a more greenish yellow. Likewise, this should look like a more reddish blue, this should look more like a greenish blue, uh, and on and on. So uh, the, the actual images that are hitting your eyes, these color patches, are the same. But your brain is doing some sort of uh, contrast effect uh, and some sort of op color opponency between nearby colors that causes you to perceive these things differently. So this quality of yellow looks different than this quality of yellow. And that's called the color assimilation effect. Uh, the next thing about uh, colors related to each other um, is the, the fact that um, there are these things called unrelated colors. And those are colors that cannot be experienced in isolation. Um, so, oh, sorry. An unrelated color can be experienced in, in isolation. Sorry. A related color is one that you cannot experience in isolation. So if we had a completely dark room with like black felt over everything, okay, and we just had a single color patch, a brown color paint chip, and we shined a white light on it, you would not see that paint chip as brown. It would look orange or it would look like brick red, but it would not look like brown. It's only if you have other colors in the scene that you get the perception of brown. Likewise, you don't. if you had a perfectly pitch black room with just a gray patch and you shined a light on it, that patch would look white. If nothing else to compare it in the room, a, a single patch, uh, your brain seems to anchor on whatever the brightest color is in the room and it treats it as white and every other color is regarded relative to that. If you added a lighter uh, gray, so look at medium gray, it's the only thing in the room, there's a medium gray, you shine a light on it, it's going to look white. If next to it you put a light gray, 
all of a sudden the light gray would look white and the medium gray would look a little little gray. Not medium, it would look kind of light gray. But next, so in other words, if there's something lighter, your visual system will anchor to the most the lightest chip uh, in the room. So that's kind of interesting. So in your perception of, of what's white and black within a scene, it anchors to the, the whitest thing in the room or the blackest thing in the room. And it treats those as uh, the blackest thing, you know, it treats them as white or black, despite the fact that they might be actually gray in other circumstances. So those are called related colors because they're only perceived relative to other colors. And brown and gray are the two examples of that. Okay, so the next phenomenon we're going to talk about are after images. And after images are um, really interesting because um, you get negative after images. So if you stare at a red patch for a while and then look at a white wall, you will see a green after image. So red stimulation, the after image produced, is green. And as you might guess, Blue stimulation produces a yellow after image, yellow produces a blue, and on and on. So whatever patch you stare at, you end up perceiving the opposite color um, in, uh, in, your, in your mind. So let's see if I can pull up um, this other uh, thing here. Um, yeah, here it is. Good. OK. so. Um, Here's what's going to happen with this. Um, so look at this dot right here. Just stare at that for a while. And uh, just keep going and stare at the dot. And we'll see what happens. Oh, OK. So uh, I'm going to let it go one more cycle. Uh, but what happens is it's a black and white image that it shifts to. Um, but you stare at, okay, so stare at the dot again. Um, so what's happening is your eyes are getting used to this negative image that you're seeing. And so when we turn it off and it's just a grayscale image, then you perceive the opposite. So instead of a cyan thing on the right, it looks like brick red. Uh, and instead of whatever it was on the left, probably some kind of blue, it looks like a tan yellow. And then the trees kind of seem uh, light green instead of purple. All right, so that's a great example of an after image, and um, that that one works really well. Um, here's the one that that's provided in the book. It's same idea. So if you were to stare at this dot right here for you know 20 seconds or something, and then glance over to this thing, you'd perceive the coloring to be like this, uh, of this guy right here by the Great Wall of China or whatever that is. Um, so uh, that's the idea of a negative after image. If you go to the, the website, the uh, Sinauer, uh website, there's a really nice activity on after images with uh, some other examples. Okay, um, so again, we're talking about color appearance. And there's this really interesting phenomenon called color constancy. And color constancy is the fact that you tend to perceive colors pretty consistently despite the fact that there are really pretty big changes in the illumination in different environments. Um, maybe sometimes you've noticed this if, if you've been shopping for clothes and you know that maybe the clothes look a little bit different color if they're under a halogen light versus under sunlight versus under a fluorescent light. Um, but for the most part, your brain is able to correct for whatever lighting situation you're in and to perceive colors correctly. So um, that's the idea of color constancy. And uh, let me see. I think I have a little video for this. Um, so let's see. All right. Yeah. Um, so this might be a little loud. I think I turned it down. Um, Let's try this. So uh, we look at this, look at this building, and um, you should perceive it that it's a white building. Um, but notice that you continue to perceive it as a white building, despite the fact that there are lots and lots of changes. Oh my God, that's so loud. There are lots and lots of changes in the lighting conditions. So sometimes it's a sunset and it looks kind of orange. Sometimes it's night. There's different shadows. But despite that fact, right, like even there where it's a little bit orange, you should perceive that as a white building. You don't think that all of a sudden the building was painted orange or yellow or something. 
Um, and that's because your brain automatically takes into account the lighting situation and helps you perceive things as being constant in their color, despite the fact that the actual image on your eye changes pretty dramatically. So that's the idea of color constancy. And in order to achieve color constancy, you have to take into account the lighting situation and disregard it. So that's called discounting the illuminant. And um, that helps you to understand what the true color of a surface is. So a luminant is the light that illuminates a surface. So here's, here's a kind of technical example, but hopefully this will help you understand this. So let's take a surface and, and think about what would happen if we had two different kinds of illumination. So this surface uh, is, is depicted here in terms of the, the portions of the, the spectrum, the color spectrum that it would reflect the most. So it looks like you're going to have a peak around the blue region and a peak around the orange-red uh, region. So this is probably be something like a kind of purpley surface uh, is what this would kind of look like, blue and red. So we're going to have two kinds of light. We're going to have a yellow, yellowish sunlight that's composed of uh, this spectrum here, or we're going to have a bluish skylight. Okay, so not the sun, maybe it's just from the, the sky. And so this is lacking the yellow and red, right, um, in this version of the illuminant. So we have two different illuminant functions that we're going to shine onto these two, the same surface. And in the next slide you see, here's what it looks like when you multiply the surface by the illuminant. You get this function here or this function. And the thing to notice is that this one, because it has the sunlight here, with, it's got a lot of red and orange in it, has more red and orange in terms of what it would look like hitting your eye than this surface. Right? It's the same surface, but this is how that same surface would look like if it was lit up by a more blue light that was lacking the red and yellow. You see that there's, there's these differences. And then if you think about how those are going to impact your different short, medium, and long cones, here's what you end up with in terms of the cone responses. To the one that had um, pretty yellowish light, you get pretty even distribution between blue, green, and red. But for the uh, surface that was seen through the skylight, that had a lot more blue in it and a lot less red and yellow. And so you end up with more short cone activity than the others. So you'd have very different activity in terms of what's actually happening at your retina. But the thing that's amazing is that your brain would figure out that there are these two different illuminants and it would subtract that away and it would come back to the same perception of the surface. You would perceive the surface as being the same color despite the fact that you saw it under very different illumination. And so how is it that you make these guesses? Um, well, you take into account all the other items in the visual field and you see if there's sort of a consistent difference in the illumination in all of them. For instance, does everything look kind of blue? Does everything look kind of yellow? And you discount that illuminant. So you're making guesses about the sources of lights, the shadows, the properties of the surfaces, the kind of lighting that's going on in the scene. And your brain all takes that into account subconsciously and kind of color corrects for it and tries to discount it so that you can get your true perception of what color really looks like. That's the idea of color constancy. And it's a pretty amazing and robust feature of our color perception system. Here's another example to maybe help you understand this. So think of this as like a shadow falling across these three different surfaces. Um, maybe you can see it that way, or maybe you might see this as like uh, kind of three transparent colored panels on top of a black diagonal stripe, something like that. There may be a, a kind of depth reversal if you look at it long enough. Um, but for instance, take a look at this red patch right here compared to this red patch. Um, when I created this, I, I just lowered this, the uh, brightness. I just cranked, I, I went into HSB color space and I cranked down the brightness for these three regions. Otherwise, they're the same color, they're just reduced in brightness. And you end up looking like a shadow. So over here, all I did was I just swapped the colors around. So what you should notice is that this red patch does not look like a shadow this red patch does, but they're the same color on your eye. So this is an example of how your eye is taking into context like, oh, there, there's a color red here. This is the same color red, but maybe it would be this color you'd see if there was a shadow. 
But here, you don't have that same thing because this red's over here and it's in a different subsurface than this red here. So this looks less like a shadow, this looks more like a shadow. All right, so uh, to kind of wrap up this section, we're going to talk a little bit about um, kind of evolutionary perspective. So why would we have color vision in the first place? Um, well, you know, one good example is that it's easy to tell when certain fruits are ripe if you can perceive the difference between red and green. So, um, for instance, if we're going to go picking raspberries, uh, you're going to be a lot better at picking raspberries if you have three cones and you have perfectly functioning color vision so you can see this, this raspberry is riper than this one, which is riper than this one right here. But if you only had grayscale vision, if you were like a cone monochromat or something, uh, you really would have a hard time telling which raspberry was ready to eat and which one wasn't. Um, so that indicates that color perception is important for animals if they're trying to gather food. And here's another really cool example of this. Um, these are daisies, and these are the same daisies on the left as on the right, but on the right, they're being seen in ultraviolet light. So there's ultraviolet light shining on them. There's some sort of filter that they applied so that you could take a picture of it. And what you see is that to our eyes, these flowers just look pretty plain and, and boring. But for a honeybee who sees in the ultraviolet light uh, condition, these look like big old bullseyes, right? There's like this white ring and then a black ring and then like a little white thing in the center. And that indicates to them that they should go land right in this black center and go check out that pollen, gather that pollen for food. So there's this evolutionary kind of dance between the food we eat and um, the, the animals and their, their, their visual systems such that um, uh, the plants that are trying to attract certain animals, like you know these daisies need the bees to pollinate them, these raspberries need people to eat them so that they can spread their seeds. That's how they get their seeds out there. Um, they will adjust uh, in the range of the color that is important for that animal. Um, another reason animals have color vision is probably uh, related to sexual reproduction. Um, so for instance, I was saying that the, you know these flowers are advertising themselves to the honeybees so that there can be some pollination there. Um, there are lots of um, what seem to be ev selective evolutionary pressure based on sexual selection that you see in animals. So there are fish with bright colors. Uh, peacocks have these really wild tails with all these different uh, really uh, beautiful patterns on them. And if you look at what a peahen looks like, they're pretty dull looking birds. They're kind of brown and they're not particularly special. But um, the peahens really like the peacocks who show off. And so there's been this evolutionary selective pressure for peacocks to become more and more and more colorful and uh, outrageous. And then there are other animals like some of our primate uh, relatives who use signaling on their face uh, when they're in uh, heat and when they're uh, sort of receptive for that kind of sexual attraction. That's one way that that's communicated to other members of their species is through the different coloring that you see on the animals. So there's also other evolutionary pressure. Um, food and sex seem to be two major evolutionary reasons that color uh, is important for animals to be able to perceive. And so um, the last thing we'll talk about is um, another version of how you could have color vision. Um, so humans and other mammals, we have different photopigments in our cones. We have different opsins that are tuned to different parts of the, the spectrum, the uh, color spectrum. But birds and reptiles have a very different system for achieving color vision, which is really pretty ingenious. Um, so if you're thinking about birds, like an eagle or a falcon or something, um, they have the same kind of photoreceptors, but they've adapted to have these really small droplets of colored oil. So their, their eyes produce this colored oil. The colored oils sit right on top of these um, 
photoreceptors, and that filters the light. So the white light that comes in, you'd only get the blue, the green, or the red portion of it. And the, that's a way that there's this kind of homologous evolution that went on between birds and reptiles and mammals. So mammals end up with red, green, and blue vision because we have three different kinds of opsins tuned to three different parts of the color spectrum. And uh, birds have three different kinds of oil droplets that sit on top of these photoreceptors. And we end up with a kind of a homologous evolution where we both have red, green, and blue um, perception, but through very different means, which is pretty interesting. So that's it for the lecture. Um, hopefully this video recorded. Um, I did the lecture once and it didn't have audio <laughs> when I went back and listened to it. So hopefully the audio is working this time. And I uh, hope you guys have a great weekend. I will see you on Wednesday.